Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences Triangle SciTech Expo. My name is Greg Scoopian, and I'll be your host for this morning's program. A couple things before we get started. First and foremost, a big shout out to our sponsors, the NC SciFest and the Biogen Foundation, for making this program and all of our programs this week happen. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, Jean M. Jean is an AmeriCorps member with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Good morning, Jean. Good morning. How are you all doing today? <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm excited to learn about colorful reactions and Ooh, really yeah. about color to nature. Um, a couple things before we get started, folks. We are coming to you live from Zoom as well as YouTube. For our viewers on Zoom, uh, if you're not familiar with the platform already, we do have a couple of um, features available for you. For example, you can access closed captioning by clicking on the bottom of your screen there where it says CC and then selecting show subtitles. For optimal viewing, we recommend using the side-by-side -side mode. That's gonna allow you to see the speaker and their slides at the same time. So you can access that by clicking on the speaker or the view button at the top of your screen. And then lastly, uh, please use the chat for all your questions and comments. We do ask that you be a good digital citizen. Uh, just keep the topics in there relevant and, uh, and positive, please. To get that chat going, I have an icebreaker question for you all. Could you drop in there, what is your favorite animal that changes colors? Jean's going to talk to us all about colors today and about some of the unique abilities of wildlife to change colors. Mm -hmm. My personal favorite is definitely the chameleon. What about yours, Jean? Oh, man. So I love my cephalopods. Um, and actually, that's one of the groups that we're going to be talking about. Um, but specifically, I'm a big fan of flamboyant cuttlefish. Um, I just really like the name, number one. And also, they're just really cool. <laughs> yeah, it looks like some other folks are saying anoles, chameleons, glass snakes. Oh, nice. You're going to teach us all about these things. So go ahead and take it away, Jean. Yeah, absolutely. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. Oopsie. There we go. All right. Can everyone see that? I hope that they can. Looks good over here. Perfect. All right. So hi, everyone. Um, and thank you so much for being here today to learn about colorful reactions. Um, before we get into the bulk of the program, I just want to give everyone sort of a brief overview of what to expect for today. So let me actually move some of these things. This is getting in the way here. Oops. There we go. All right. Okay. So yeah, for this program, um, we're going to be going over sort of which animals can ch change color, um, the purpose of changing color how this even happens, um, give a quick sort of overview of visible light, so how we can perceive color and see some of these really cool visual displays that animals make. Um, oops, where's my arrow? There we go. Um, the types of cells that certain animals have to be able to even change their colors. Um, and I have a few demonstrations that I'll um, show on camera as well. We're going to meet some really cool animals um, that can actually uh, change colors. And then lastly, we're going to tie everything up at the very end um, and relate the color changing abilities of these animals to technology since we are in SciTech week. So moving right along. So yeah, I also have a question for you um, before we uh, move forward. Um, and you can drop your answers into the chat for this one. So the first question is, can humans change color? And if so, when or how does this even happen? Again, you can type your answers into the chat and we can go from there. There we go. All right. Jean, I, I know I changed colors when I spend too much time out in the sun. Me too. I, def <laughs> I heat up way too fast. And also I get embarrassed very easily. So I'll turn like really dark red or pink. <laughs> so. Yeah, it looks I like wonder if anyone else goes through that. <laughs> yeah, some, some folks are saying they blush when they're embarrassed or when they're shy. Uh, when, you yep. get, uh, when you get a bruise, you'll change colors. And uh, oh, yeah, tanning perfect. and blushing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, so humans, we actually can change color um, or into a few different um, colors, um, depending on how we're feeling uh, mentally, emotionally, and even physically. Um, so some of these colors could include um, turning red from blushing or from, you know, uh, being embarrassed or 
even angry or like Greg said, um, being out in the sun for a little bit too long, you can get a little toasty and red from that as well. Um, we can also change into sort of like a bluish color um, because of either lack of oxygen in our blood or from some other medical condition. There's also a possibility for us to turn a yellowish color due to mainly medical conditions as well. And the example that I used is jaundice. And this is um, something that occurs usually when a yellowish chemical called bil bilirubin, if I'm not mistaken, like builds up in your body and sort of changes your skin color to a yellowish color, which is really interesting. Um, we can also change into like a greenish color. Again, someone mentioned the bruising, um, especially towards the end of the healing phase of a bruise, it can turn sort of greenish. I actually had one on my knee earlier um, this week, but it's gone now. Um, and lastly, uh, we can turn a palish or lighter sort of color, um, depending on how we're feeling as well, especially when we're feeling sort of ill, sick, like we have a cold or we feel nauseous, we can turn that pale color. Um, and when we change colors, uh, maybe not as quickly as some of the animals that we're going to talk about, um, this can indicate a lot a lot of different things actually. Um, like mentioned before, it might show how we're feeling mentally, emotionally, or physically. And it can also indicate that something may not really be going right or all that well with our body until we see a doctor about it. All right. So now if we can change different colors because of how we're feeling or because of our environment or some medical condition, what are some other animals that can change color in response to their environment? And as some of you may have already mentioned or already know, um, there are a lot more animals than we expect that can change colors. And some of these animals actually include um, some animals that Greg and I talked about at the beginning, um, but our cephalopods, which is a group of animals that includes our cuttlefishes, our squids and our octopuses. And also we have our chameleons that can change colors as well, which you may have already known about. Um, and these animals have very special cells in their skin that allow them to have this really fascinating ability um, to change colors. But before we sort of you know, dive into how they even do this, um, why do you think they would even want to change colors? Like what would the purpose be of you know, these animals changing their colors in their environment? You can again, type that into the chat. <laughs> One reason may be to maybe attract a mate or Ooh, communicate bingo. with members of their species. Yep, beautiful. <laughs> Any other guesses or ideas as to why they would want to change colors? Looking at your pictures or that, that third image, uh, camouflage mm -hmm. is certainly going to be. Yep, perfect. Yeah, so by changing colors, um, cephalopods, Pods and chameleons are, again, able to communicate with other animals in their environment. And some of the messages that they kind of give off to uh, other members of their species or to just in, like other species in general, um, or actually more particularly within their species, um, involves, oopsie, tell me what happened. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that, folks. But yeah, some of these messages involves um, attracting a mate, um, communicating with others within uh, their species or outside of their species as well. Um, especially when they're feeling um, threatened, they can sort of show these colors and say, hey, stay away from me. I, I really feel uncomfortable with you being so close to me. Um, and then another reason for them to change colors is also for their protection or to be able to camouflage um, from predators or a perceived threat. So good job. All right, so moving right along. Okay, so yeah, now um, that we've talked about uh, sort of why these animals change colors or why they would even want to, you know, how does this even happen? So as mentioned before, uh, both cephalopods and chameleons um, have very important cells in their skin that can work together to give them this really cool uh, ability to change colors. Now, when you were looking at this GIF, does anyone know what these cells are or what they're called? <laughs> We have one guess of melanin. Melanin? Ooh, that is a good guess. Um, our chameleons, chameleons, I can't talk, actually have melanin in their skin. Um, but with these particular uh, cells, I believe these are, um, they have different pigments, but these are actually chromatophores. Um, and chromatophores are cells that contain pigments or colors inside of them. Um, and melanin is a type of um, pigment as well. 
Um, but in our cephalopods, uh, these chromatophores are full of pigments or pigmented sacs um, that can actually display certain colors when muscles around the cell are stimulated by a nerve um, signal. So in this GIF, let me let it run again. I paused it because I didn't want it to be a distraction. Um, but yeah, so in this GIF, what we're seeing is a cephalopod chromatophore or cephalopod chromatophores um, in action. But in chameleons, uh, which also have chromatophores, scientists have found that they don't really function the same way that we're seeing it in cephalopod skin. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, later in the program, but chameleons like cephalopods also have other cells in their skin that will interact and help to produce certain um, colors and visual displays that we see. All right. So let me move right along. Okay. And um, the way that we see colors is actually really fascinating um, because colors are actually wavelengths of light that bounce off or reflect off of an object. So for instance, I have my little snake plant here, big fan of plants. I hope you can see that on the camera. Um, but when we're looking at this plant, what color is everyone able to see? And it may not be the same color that we might expect. So that's okay. <laughs> green, of course. Green, yeah, bingo. So yeah, we're seeing the color green and essentially what's happening is the wavelength for the color green um, is bouncing off of the leaves of this plant while other wavelengths of light are being absorbed. And as humans, we're typically able to see um, within the visible spectrum of light, which includes the colors of a rainbow or Roy G. Biv as sort of the short acronym, um, between ultraviolet and infrared light. So if we look here from the purple to the red, that's sort of our visible spectrum, and then ultraviolet on the left and infrared on the right, those are outside of our uh, visible spectrum. Um, and let me see here, yeah. And so we have important structures in our eyes as well as photoreceptor cells that sort of all work together for us to be able to perceive um, these wavelengths of light as a particular color. Now for some people, um, especially folks with color blindness, um, the photoreceptor cells, which includes our cones and our rods, um, may function a bit differently. And it can give these colors a completely different appearance, which is totally fine. Um, and as a side note, uh, as I mentioned infrared light a little bit earlier, um, infrared light, again, is not something that we can see, but it is something that we can feel as heat, you know, on our skin. Um, so just keep that in mind, uh, because we will talk a bit more about that towards, uh, so towards the end or like more towards the middle of the program. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So now that we have some, you know, background knowledge about color, you know, why these animals would want to change color, how that works, um, we're going to focus a little bit more on the skin of cephalopods and chameleons. So if you can recall um, from a bit earlier, uh, both animal groups have these cells called the chromatophores, um, but they also have cells called iridophores. But these cells, as you can tell, probably from the little parentheses, um, are not only structured differently, but they do function differently as well, which we'll talk about again a little bit later. Um, some cephalopods uh, will actually have cells called leucophores, and chameleons will have cells called melanophores. And that's actually where the melanin pigment, as someone mentioned earlier, will come into play. Um, so let's dive a little deeper into that. All right. So when we are taking a deeper look into the skin of cephalopods first, um, we can break down each cell type. So again, as a reminder, the chromatophores contain those uh, pigmented sacs within them. And usually for the cephalopods, um, these pigmented sacs are either red, yellow, or brown in color. And of course, with the interaction again uh, of the muscles and nerve signals, um, we can see the chromatophores change from like a small dark speck to a more vibrant color as muscles around the cells pull on them and expand them. So I have a little GIF here that can hopefully show that pretty clearly. So you can see they go from little small specks or smaller specks and then they expand out because of the help of, or with the help of muscles and nerve signals. All right, whoops, there we go. And so iridophores again are another type of cell within cephalopod skin, um, but these iridophores in cephalopods actually contain reflective plates um, to reflect light back out into the environment um, to appear a certain sort of iridescent or shiny color. And depending on the angle from which you're looking at an animal with these cells in their skin, um, the colors can appear like a shiny green or like a blue, silver, and even like a gold and sometimes even red too. 
Um, so again, I have another GIF here that I can show you. So you see all those little sparkly sort of <laughs> cells there? Those are like the iridophores, which is really cool. All right. And our last cell that um, we want to highlight is the leucophore. And leucophores are only found in some cephalopods, so not all cephalopods. Um, and these cells can reflect the colors of the environment. So what does that mean? So they can actually reflect all wavelengths of light um, to make them appear sort of like a whitish color. And um, by doing this, they can also help to enhance the colors that are in the chromatophore. So the pigments in the chromatophores can look a bit brighter and more vibrant um, with the help of that white sort of background. And again, the cells have, these cells have the ability to reflect the colors of the environment, which can help them to sort of blend in with their surroundings and sort of camouflage them and protect them from any uh, predators or perceived threats. So here I have a diagram with sort of all of the different cells that we just talked about. So the chromatophores, which are the, the brown, the red, and the yellow here, the yellow one is like stretched out. Um, we also have the iridophores here with all the different sort of like stripes through them and then the leucophores. So basically we're seeing the interaction um, between light and these cells. So with the iridophores, it looks like some light is coming in and then what's bouncing off is sort of like a bluish silvery or not silvery, but shiny bluish light that would show up um, if we looked at the animal a certain way. And then of course we have the chromatophores and the leucophores here. We see all these different arrows that are sort of coming off um, that's most likely the light coming in and all the different wavelengths of light sort of coming out at the same time. So it looks like a white sort of color. All right. So there we go. All right. So yeah, I have a demo for our cephalopod skin here. Um, and it definitely looks a lot different than what you saw in the GIFs in the previous slide, but hopefully it can help you to sort of remember how this all works. Um, but before I sort of start playing around with our demo here, um, if you do wanna to try to make your own chromatophore at home, um, all you're gonna need is a clear balloon, um, some acrylic paint or paint of your choice, um, and some water that goes inside of that as well. Um, so basically, I'm gonna stop sharing really quickly just so you could see my screen a little bit bigger. There we go, okay. So yeah, so I have my little chromatophore here. Again, it looks really different from the chromatophores in the GIF. But essentially what's going to happen is my hands will act as the muscles that are around the chromatophore and then my brain will send the nerve signal. So when my brain sends the nerve signal to my hands or the muscles, it will pull on the chromatophore. So it will uh, contract. So pulling is contracting. And then if the nerve signal isn't there anymore, it will go back to its original form. And so basically this will happen a lot when our stuff will pods are contracting their muscles to change their color. So yeah, there's that. Um, and let me share my screen again, just so we can get that back up. Uh, oopsie. Oops. It's not moving. Uh -oh. Sorry, everyone. There we go. There we go. Oops. <laughs> it's not moving. There we go. So yeah, I hope that kind of makes sense on how the chromatophore um, essentially works. So yeah, when the muscles um, are contracting or pulling the chromatophore, that's how you can see the color a bit more vibrantly um, from the, the cell. And when it's not contracting, so when it's not pulling it uh, apart essentially, the color isn't as bright or vibrant at all and it can look like a dark speck. Okay. And so um, before I move on any further, did we have any questions in the chat at all, Greg? Um, just in case. I'm not seeing any. Um, I had a question myself. Okay. When when they contract, do they do they stay that way, or is it like a rapid pulsing? Do you understand what I'm saying? Ooh. Yeah, I think so. Is it more like a boom 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 is boom, boom kind of boom, thing, or is it just or a is boom, it boom and like... it holds? <laughs> yeah. So I'm actually not sure if it's a boom 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 situation or if it just like holds it for a little bit and then goes back. But just based on sort of the, the videos that I've seen, it seems to be something that acts really quickly. Um, but again, when we look at the actual animal, when they actually change colors, those colors sort of hold for a while. So I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question, but I can look into that a little okay. later. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> of okay. course, thanks for the question. <laughs> um, Sylvia says she doesn't understand, but hopefully 
Yeah. Things will become more clear as we see a couple examples from the real world. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry it didn't make any um, make that much sense, but yeah, we'll definitely go over that a little bit. <laughs> These are, these are new concepts. We're all learning at the same time. Oh, for um, sure, yeah. And then Harmony wants to know, why can't we see ultraviolet light? You know, that's a good question. Um, it might have something to do with the structures within our eyes. Um, they may not be able, we may not be able to perceive those colors because of just the way that we're structured. But um, other than that, I'm not really entirely sure how else to answer that question. I'm sorry, Harmony. <laughs> all right, that's it for now. Thanks, okay, Jake. perfect. Yeah, of course. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to get into our chameleon skin. And chameleon skin um, actually has some cells that are very similar to our cephalopods, as we saw earlier. Um, but they're structured and function a bit differently than those in cephalopod skin. So starting again with our chromatophores, they do have those pigments um, in, in the cells. But these pigments are specifically red and yellow in color. Um, and unlike our cephalopods, these cells don't expand um, and shrink like they did in the cephalopod skin. So they don't do this whole number here. Um, and so if they're not expanding or contracting, how exactly are they even changing colors? And that is where the iridophore comes in. But before I even show that or go into that a little bit, I almost forgot to show you our little gif of our chameleon changing color. Um, and so basically with this GIF, you're seeing that it can change sort of into, uh, or it can have sort of the yellowish reddish coloration. Um, so you can see that in here. But yeah, let's talk a little more about our iridophores. Um, and so basically what happens here with these iridophores is, oops, sorry, there we go. <laughs> it keeps like moving back and forth. Um, let me see here, okay. So yeah, so when we're looking at our iridophores, these cells actually contain um, something called a guanine nanocrystal. And these are highly organized cells that uh, occur in the skin. And what happens here is when light hits these particular cells, um, the wavelength that is bounced off can actually go through the chromatophore pigments to show us a particular color. And I'm sure you're going, you know, like, what are you even talking about? I don't understand what you're saying. Um, and I'll give some more examples about that. So for one example, to maybe help you uh, visualize this, let's say light is touching our, or hits our iridophore and blue light is bounced off from that. That blue light can then go through the yellow pigment in our chromatophore. And what you see in the skin is a green sort of coloration or a green color, because when you mix blue and yellow together, you get that green color. So hopefully that makes a bit more sense, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and as this gift kept appearing um, on accident, uh, this is actually one of those guanine nanocrystals in the skin. And as you can see, it was changing color from the red, orange, yellow, green to the blue, which is really fascinating to see. All right. And so, oops, let me go here, if it will work with me. There we go. All right. So our last type of cell that we want to talk about too within chameleon skin is the melanophore. And melanophores are these star-shaped cells, <clears throat> excuse me, that contain that melanin pigment. Um, and this pigment appears sort of like a brown or a, a black color as well. Um, and it's contained within another cell known as a melanosome, um, which can can actually move around inside the melanophore. So we have the pigment that's inside a melanosome, which is inside the melanophore. <laughs> so hopefully that um, makes sense. So when the melanosome moves into sort of those finger-like projections, um, because again, the cell is sort of star-shaped, um, the spreading of those uh, melanosomes and the melanin pigment can help the animal appear uh, a darker color. But when those melanosomes move back into the center of the melanophore, um, the animal can appear lighter. And I have a GIF here again to show that. So we see the melanosomes and the melanin spreading out into those finger-like projections. And then they come back to the center and the animal can appear lighter, which is really cool. All right, so moving along. So we have um, a cross-section uh, diagram here, kind of like what we showed earlier with the cephalopod skin. Um, and this diagram actually shows uh, the interaction between the chromatophores, the iridophores, and light. Again, just like the last um, diagram that we had. So if we look at the middle cross-section here, if you can see all the smaller details in here as well, we're seeing 
uh, the light coming um, into the skin, hitting the iridophore, which is in this layer here. And what we're seeing is a blue wavelength of light that bounces off of the iridophore, and it's going through the yellow pigment in a chromatophore, which is right on top. And so now what you're seeing on the skin is a green color. So just like what was mentioned earlier, um, that's basically what the diagram is showing. And to sort of um, drill in that concept too, we have this right uh, cross section here as well. And so all the light is coming in, it hits the iridophore here. The iridophore is bouncing off a particular wavelength of light. And I believe it's a red wavelength of light. I think that's what it is. And it's going through another uh, chromatophore with yellow pigment. And so when you mix red and yellow, you get orange. And so there's the orange sort of skin or orange coloration on the skin as well. And if you look down here, you kind of see all these little dots in a circle. And I'm pretty sure you're thinking like, I don't even know what that is. What does that have to do with any of this? So with the guanine nanocrystals, the way that they reflect light back out into the environment, it depends on how spaced out these crystals are. So the closer the crystals are together, um, the different, the, well, let me reword that. There's a different wavelength of light that's reflected out. And same concept, when the crystals are stretched out further apart from each other, a different wavelength of light is shown that way. Um, so all of that is pretty fascinating. All right. Okay, and so I also have a um, demo for our chameleon skin. And again, this is just to show that interaction between the chromatophores, iridophores, and, um, and light. Um, so if you want to try this at home as well, um, I just used the clear balloon, uh, some acrylic paint for this again, uh, a light source or a flashlight. I had two flashlights that I could use um, and some tape just to tape on the balloons onto the light. So um, what I did here is I painted one of my flashlights with the balloon uh, blue, and I'll stop sharing in just a second. And then the other one I painted yellow, but the yellow is on top of another blue balloon. And I'll explain why I did that. So first, let me stop sharing. Okay, so yeah, essentially what I'm doing here, or what I'm trying to simulate is this blue on this balloon is supposed to act as the blue light that's bouncing off of the iridophore nanocrystals. And so when I flash this light here, hopefully you can see it. I have like a window that's like reflecting against me. So it might not show up too well. It's just kind of showing up as white, I feel like. But this is supposed to be a blue light. <laughs> so this is just the light that's bouncing off of the iridophore. But now when the light is going through our chromatophore, so let's say the chromatophore has the yellow pigment again, the mixing of the blue and the yellow sort of create this green color. Sorry, <laughs> it's not showing as brightly as it did before. But yeah, there we go. Hopefully that um, makes more sense there. <laughs> and oops, if this will work with me again. All right, so I'm gonna move you down here. Okay. There we go. Um, so yeah, that is our chameleon skin demonstration. Um, did anyone have questions about our cephalopod skin or our chameleon skin or any of the diagrams before I keep going? Jean, there was there was a question. I think it was about the mm -hmm. iridophores and that the GIF that you played. Yeah, um, yeah. Ruxin over on YouTube was wondering what is the smoke thing in the video? There was some component that looked like smoke, I guess. I don't hmm. know if you can go back to that. Yeah, let's take a look at that really quickly. Smoke. Oh, I see. So like all of this, like the, the fuzzy bits there, sort of, I'm guessing is what they're referring to. I'm actually not sure what those fuzzy bits are. It might just be other like skin cells, but I um, don't actually have details on that on the fuzzy bit. But that's a good question because I, I should have looked into that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's, uh, those are all the questions I'm seeing right now. Okay, um, perfect. Let me go back. All right. Oh yeah, and that was just to show um, sort of the color changes. There we go. All right, so now that we've kind of gone over um, why these animals change color, how that even happens. Let's meet some of our um, animal species that can actually change color. Um, and our first 
uh, cephalopod species is the big fin, big fin <laughs> reef squid or Sepiotuthis um, lesioniana. Um, and they are also commonly known as the oval squid uh, because of their characteristic fin um, that goes around the mantle of their body. So we have the fin pointed out here, it goes all the way around the mantle, which is the structure here. Um, and this particular species, uh, they also have uh, really cool um, like arms. They have eight arms and um, two tentacles that are mainly used for capturing and holding prey. Um, and this species is usually found around the Indo-Pacific waters of Australia, New Zealand, um, Japan, and Hawaii. But they've also been seen in other areas um, like Africa and India. Um, and they're more of a coastal species. So you'll see them a lot um, in like seagrass beds, coral reefs, and sort of like sandy bottom areas. Um, but a really interesting fact about this species is that um, temperature may play a big role in their growth rate. So how big, um, so how fast they can grow or how slow they grow. And because of this particular aspect of the species, scientists might be able to use them in the future as sort of an indicator of rising water temperatures. But of course, there's more research that needs to go into this. So just something um, interesting to think about. Um, but not exactly set in stone yet. Oh, okay, there we go. That's okay. All right. So when this particular species um, changes color, um, it can be for a few different reasons. It can be to attract a mate, um, to compete with other males. So males competing with other males for a female um, or males trying to guard their partner um, from other males once they've mated. Um, so in this video, basically what you're gonna see is the males and females changing colors, but there's one particular moment that you will see um, two males sort of like diving in towards one of the females, I believe, and they uh, will change color and start sort of signaling to each other. So let me play that. Okay, there we go. So we see all of our big fin reef squid here um, at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and right here, there we go. So we saw the two, I believe males, um, and the one that's right in the middle, you can see sort of like the bands of color that they're starting to show. And I'm not sure if that was more of like a warning, um, but we see that color change. Um, and these two, the male and the female, actually change color as they're mating too, um, which is really interesting. There we go. And there's that. Perfect. Okay. Oops. Oh, whoa. That's weird. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about the weird little like stuff that, that happens on the screen. Um, but yeah, so another cephalopod um, that changes color is the flamboyant cuttlefish. And I mentioned this earlier, it's one of my favorite um, cephalopods just because it just seems really cool. Um, and these animals can actually be seen with a very colorful pattern um, of like browns, purples, pinks, yellows, and whites um, on their body. Uh, they also, like the big fin reef squid, have eight arms and two tentacles, um, but the eight arms can actually be used for them to walk along the seafloor, and the tentacles can again be used um, to capture prey. Um, on their mantle, so right on the structure here, they have these large flat um, sort of structures called papillae, and these are important for them to, to possibly use during camouflage um, because it helps to, to sort of break up the, the shaping of the cuttlefish and kind of um, helps with that. Um, and they are usually found um, in Indonesia, like Papua New Guinea and Australia, and they'll usually dwell around like sandy or muddy areas as well as coral reefs. Um, and a fun fact about them is that uh, they are the only known cuttlefish species to be venomous. So they're not the, the only cephalopod, but the only um, cuttlefish species that we know of to be venomous. Um, and the reason why I make that distinction is because our next um, animal that we're gonna talk about in a little bit is another venomous species of a cephalopod. Um, why is it in, before oh. you advance slides, mm -hmm. Sylvia is wondering where is the cuttlefish's mouth? Oh, so if we look, so we have the arms, it should be right <laughs> in the middle of where all the arms are. So I don't know how to show that. I should have brought up my Squishmallow octopus because I could have shown it from that. But essentially the arms are gonna be there and then towards like the very middle, or like the very middle, um, there should be the, the beak there <laughs> or the mouth. Is it is it visible at, on your photo here at all? Or is it at least the general area? Hmm. Uh, so probably most, mm, maybe if we like went 
through this portion here. It could be deeper in that area. That's like the best place that I can point it out from. But maybe if we looked at the video too, I might be able to point it out from there. So let me try that out as well. Um, but thank you, Greg. <laughs> Let's see. Oop, it's doing that again. Okay, so maybe uh, that's also a little difficult. But yeah, if you were to go like straight back from this point, the mouth should be somewhere in that general vicinity back there. <laughs> I hope that helps a little bit. Um, but yeah, so with our flamboyant cuttlefish, um, similar to our big fin reef squids, uh, they will also change colors to attract mates and also to fight or compete with other males um, as well. But another reason for them to sort of want to change colors is also to warn predators to get away from them. Um, and in this video, you'll actually see our flamboyant cuttlefish sort of flashing its colors and it'll even change into a darker color um, as the video progresses. Um, I'm not entirely sure if that is to warn off the predators or if it was uh, sort of a mating display, uh, but we will see um, the color changes there. There we go. So if you see that it's kind of like really hypnotic when you're just watching the colors flashing. Um, and then here it turned a darker color, which is vastly different from the from when it started out. Um, so yeah, so it started sort of like a, oops, where'd it go? It's just a slow video. So yeah, it wasn't as dark um, at the very beginning and then towards the end, it's, it's very dark. All right. Okay, so yeah, so our last cephalopod species that, um, that I want to highlight here uh, is the greater blue-ringed octopus, or Haploclina lunulata. Um, and this species is usually seen with sort of like a tan or like a dark yellow coloration, which you could see um, in this picture here. And sometimes they might even ap appear gray. Um, I haven't seen pictures of them being like really gray, but the yellowish is um, fairly common that I see on the internet at least. Um, but they're also given the, the name blue ringed octopus uh, because of those blue rings um, that appear on their skin, as you can see again in this picture, um, on their body when they feel threatened. And um, unlike the last two cephalopods that we talked about, um, this particular species does not have the, 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 the eight arms and the two tentacles. They only have the eight arms uh, with a lot of suckers on them, which is still really cool. Um, and this species can also be found around uh, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, Papua New Guinea, and other places around the Indo-Pacific waters. Um, and they usually inhabit uh, more shallower waters where they can be found in sort of like tide pools, uh, coral reefs, and also um, algae clumps, which is really fun to see them in if you see videos of them as well. Um, but let's say you go on vacation to this area and you happen to come across one of our uh, blue ringed octopuses. Um, I highly recommend that you don't pick them up and hold them in your hand um, because they are they are a venomous species. Um, and actually the, the reason why they're gonna shine those uh, blue rings is to warn you and say, hey, I'm not comfortable with you being that close. Please don't come close to me. So if you go close to them still and then you pick them up, they have the capability of biting you and injecting a toxin called tetrodotoxin. Um, and at first I thought it was just uh, a toxin that could paralyze your muscles, but actually what happens is it sort of shuts down the nerve signals to your muscles and that can lead to some sort of paralysis of the, of the body. So yeah, just be careful. Um, there is no anti-venom for this particular toxin. Um, so just admire these animals from afar, just like what you want to do with most of nature, just so we don't stress them out. Um, but yeah, I have a video here um, to show the greater blue ringed octopus shining its blue light or blue rings um, at the scuba diver. And um, that happened more when the scuba diver was a little too close. But once the scuba diver sort of backs off, it dulls down those rings. So let's play that. Ooh, ooh, okay, there we go. <laughs> so yeah, it's a little dull right now. Um, but it's still flashing those blue lights because um, the scuba diver was kind of close. Um, but as you can tell from just the distance as well, um, they were sort of backing off and we see the rings are not as bright. And if you couldn't really tell the color differences, I also have a, oh dear, oh dear. Okay, there we go. I also have a slide here that shows the before and after. So before when um, the scuba diver was really, really close, 
we can see those really bright blue rings on the body. But then when the scuba diver was kind of, you know, backed off a little bit, um, we can see that it's a little duller, um, the blue rings. So hopefully that clears it up a little bit. Oops. There we go. All right, so we're gonna move on to our chameleon species. Um, and we have the veiled chameleon or chameleo calyptratus. Um, and this species is usually like a light green um, color. Um, and the males will also have other colors like yellows, blues, and browns on their skin as well. Um, the females are also a light green, but they tend to have a uh, white uh, color on their skin as well. Um, and both the males and females of this particular species have this really bony sort of thin-like structure on their head that you can see right here, and that's called a cask. Um, the function of that cask, from what I've read, is to help water sort of come down towards their face or their mouth, um, so that's a pretty useful structure. Um, and also because of the presence of this cask, they're also given this fitting common name of the cone-headed chameleon, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, and they're native to the Saudi Arabia and Yemen area where they're usually found in arboreal habitats um, such as woodlands and gardens. Um, but because they've been released um, and also sort of escaped their uh, adoptive homes as they are a very popular pet species, um, they have also established some populations in Florida and Hawaii where they're considered invasive, unfortunately. Um, but an interesting fact about uh, our veiled chameleons is that they have a very long sticky tongue that actually extends about 1.5 times their body length. So to help you visualize, um, these chameleons are usually 10 to 24 inches in length. So if the tongue can go 1.5 times the body length, it can probably stretch out as long as its body length and then some um, to capture prey, which is pretty long. All right. There we go. And so I have a video here of the um, of veiled chameleons changing color. And they'll want to change colors for a lot of different reasons as well, as we may have discussed earlier, uh, to attract mates, also to um, signal to other males um, or compete with other males, and also to defend territory. Um, the females can also change colors to possibly indicate if they're pregnant or if they even want to mate with a male. Um, but this video shows two males um, two male veiled chameleons. And when they see each other, you're gonna see them change shape as well as colors. Specifically this left chameleon here, you're gonna see more of the changes with that one first. So let me play that. So if we pay attention to this guy. He saw the other male, so he makes himself look a little bigger, buffs himself out. <laughs> and then you can slowly see the color change on there. So there's the lighter greens, um, some orange, I believe, and like a teal color, basically throughout its body and even on its cask too, you can see the color change there. Um, and of course that color change was a little bit slow and if you didn't catch that immediately, again, I have um, the before and after. So it started off sort of as a brown, sort of dull color. And then after it had all those flashy bright colors that you can see here. Oops, there we go. All right, so our last um, chameleon species is the Jackson's chameleon or Chameleo jacksoni. Um, and these chameleons are usually bright green with hints of like blue and yellow color. Also called the three horned chameleon uh, because of the three horns, um, especially on the male's face. Uh, the females don't have these horns. So that's a difference between the males and the females. Um, and they can use those horns to defend their territory. Um, they're native to Kenya and Tanzania, more of the humid and cooler regions, um, but also in the mountainous areas of these uh, particular areas. Um, and unfortunately, some of these chameleons were also introduced to Hawaii because they're also a very popular pet species. Um, and they may be um, a problem for the native uh, species of other animals in Hawaii. Um, but a fun fact about them is that the females will actually give live births um, to around eight to 30 uh, live young compared to other species that usually lay eggs um, to their young. So that's a really interesting um, fact. And there we go. And so here, uh, again, 
This particular species will want to change color um, to communicate with other chameleons, but it can also change colors to potentially show that it's um, feeling threatened or uncomfortable. Um, and chameleons in general might also change colors uh, because of the temperature and humidity of the environment. So in this particular video, there is a pet Jackson's chameleon in some uh, foliage, and you'll see it changing from like a lighter green, like this color that you see here, to like a darker, uh, darker color, especially around the ridge, so like this area. So we'll watch that. So again, it's a very slow change, but I'll have a sort of like a review slide for that. There we go. All right. So ooh, what just happened? Okay, there we go. So before it was that lighter sort of green with some hints of that darker color. And then towards the end, it turned into that darker, very dark green. Oops. Oh, right. So now we, we are in SciTech week. So I'm sure you're wondering like, how does this have anything to do with technology? Um, but as scientists have done um, in the past and they continue to do even now, um, they are constantly inspired by nature and all of its fascinating sort of uh, characteristics and abilities, including this color changing ability that both cephalopods and chameleons have. Um, so scientists from different uh, universities and backgrounds um, have been interested in sort of improving different aspects of our everyday lives. And some of these improvements have included uh, sort of better ways of helping people camouflage out in the field, especially folks who happen to be part of the military, um, and also to create more vibrant and brighter colors on clothing in particular to help with signaling, um, signaling other people or signaling help during rescue missions. Um, and that particular, some of those studies um, that were involved in this uh, um, were inspired from cephalopod skin. So those uh, chromatophores there. And scientists have also been interested in finding uh, ways of regulating the temperature of buildings, electronic devices, and the human body more effectively by drawing inspiration again from cephalopod chromatophores, which may have the potential to uh, reflect or absorb infrared light, um, which again, I mentioned is not something we can see, but something that we can feel. Um, other scientists have also studied chameleon skin as well, um, specifically those uh, guanine nanocrystals, and they've been interested in creating more effective and efficient screen displays for our electronic devices um, to make sure that we don't have to use as much energy to um, power them up and to use them compared to how it's being used right now. Um, and lastly, another point is with the, the chameleon iridophores, my words are all blurring together, sorry. With the chameleon iridophores, um, they may also have the potential to act as sensors um, to detect like damage or structural ch changes to buildings, um, planes, and even bridges. But you know, for all of these improvements, there has to be a bit more research that goes into them. And also if scientists are looking to create you know, materials using these animals as a reference, um, there has to be a lot of trial runs and tests that need to be done as well um, to, to see if they work and how well they work and things like that. And so I wanna finish us off with this video on the right here. Um, and this video uh, contains a material known as an electroactive polymer, which is a type of polymer material that will change shape and size um, after it receives an electrical stimulus. And scientists that did this particular study using this material, um, they were drawing inspiration from, again, cephalopod chromatophores. So let's take a look at that. It's just a very simple video. So when they received the electrical stimulus, they got bigger and then they got smaller. Um, but yeah, so these scientists are looking to hopefully use this material in maybe clothing or some type of wearable uh, material that can um, help to change colors for camouflaging and also for signaling. But let's see, there we go. But yeah, that's all I have for you today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the program as much as I enjoyed teaching it. But if you have any other questions, I will stick around for a few more minutes um, to answer those. But thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jean. That was great. Um, we, we have a question here in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Can all chameleons change into any color of the rainbow? 
Ooh, that is a good question. I feel like when it comes to making the statement of all things can do something, there's always an exception. So I can't, I don't have enough knowledge about chameleons and all the different chameleon species to say that. Um, but I know that some are still able to change color and I'm not sure if they're able to change into all the colors of the rainbow. I know there are videos on like YouTube and just on the internet where people are showing that um, chameleons can change into all different colors um, based on things that they touch. Um, but I'm not entirely sure if that's true. Um, so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I'm sorry I couldn't answer any more of that. <laughs> and there's a lot of people dreaming about rainbow colored chameleons now. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's actually a species known as the panther chameleon, if I'm not mistaken, and they can turn into some really bright, uh, it, it's not a rainbow, but they can turn into like really pretty red, uh, yellow, orange, green, black, like all like on the same, at the same time, like on their skin. So if you want to look them up, they're really pretty too. <laughs> it's not a rainbow, but a lot of colors. Um, I had a question. Mm -hmm. So I saw my first hummingbird of the year mm -hmm. just, just earlier this week. Yeah. And, you know, when the light hits it a certain way, it flashes that beautiful ruby color. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Now is, is that the same thing of what you've been describing here this morning or is there something going on else different going on with the, the feathers of that bird? Yeah. So basically it's not the same as what we were talking about with the cephalopod or the chameleon iridophores because the cephalopods, um, they were reflecting light back out um, with a certain wavelength of light. And then the chameleon, or we know, yeah, that's what they were doing. And then the chameleons are doing the same thing. Um, with the hummingbirds, it's more of the structures within the feathers. And even with the morpho butterfly, it's the structures on their wing scales that help to um, diffract light a certain way. So all the light kind of like spreads out and it can also sort of like cancel each other out because they're also like spread out and doing their own thing. Um, so that is sort of how we can see those colors. But that's also the extent to my knowledge on that particular um, subject, but I hope that kind of gives you an idea of what's happening there. So it's not the same as what the cephalopods and the chameleons are doing, um, but it is more of a structural um, thing with yeah. the feathers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, it's more of an external thing while the cephalopods and chameleons, those changes are happening internally. Mm -hmm. And then coming out. <laughs> okay. All right, here's a tough one. Oh, okay. Grayson, Grayson wants to know if chameleons can change their blood cell size. Whoa. First of all, that's a great question. Second, I have no idea, but that'd be really cool if they could. <laughs> yeah, because if they can, you know, manipulate the, the iridophores and like the spacing between them, you know, maybe, but I, <laughs> I definitely don't know. I don't know if that would really be possible. <laughs> yeah. That's all the questions I'm seeing right now, Jean. Oh, Thank you so much for teaching yeah. us all about colors um, and the mechanisms responsible for mm -hmm. changing colors. It, that was fascinating. I learned a lot, not only about color, but about some really cool species. I have to say that that greater blue ring <laughs> octopus is phenomenal. I think that's my Yeah, it's a really cool species. I mean, again, I love my cephalopod, so I'm a little biased on that. But I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I hope, you know, everyone else, you know, learned or was able to take something away from this program as well. But thank you. <laughs> Thanks again, Jean, and thanks to everybody who attended here today. If you want to watch more programs like this one, we have several days left in the Triangle SciTech Expo. We'll drop the, the link to our schedule so you can see all the, the great presentations that we have offered this week. Thanks again to Jean. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>